Good evening. I'm Graham Allison, director of the Center for Science and International Affairs and former dean of the school. And on behalf of Harvard University, I want to welcome you to the forum tonight and say what a great honor it is to welcome tonight's speaker, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Dr. Sadako Ogata. Dr. Ogata is one of the towering figures on the international stage today, one of the people who measures up to her responsibilities, which include about 27 million people in over 100 desperate settings around the world. She manages a budget of $1.3 billion annually, most of which she raises as well as spins. For now six years, Mrs. Ogata has led what is generally regarded in the international community as the most effective, most efficient agency of the United Nations. While Sadako Ogata is well known in the international political arena, she also has a well-deserved reputation in the academy. A, dis a respected scholar, she was educated at the University of the Sacred Heart in Tokyo and at Georgetown University before receiving her PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley. Mrs. Ogata was a professor at a number of universities in Japan and later dean of the faculty of foreign studies at Sofia University and director of their Institute for International Relations. She's wi a widely published author on diplomatic history and international relations, writing on a wide range of subjects from Japanese foreign policy in the 1930s to European immigration policy today. Dr. Ogata was the first woman to hold a senior position in the permanent mission of Japan to the United Nations and served as representative of Japan to the United Nations Commission for Human Rights from 1982 to 1985. In her role as head of the UNHCR, she's not only overseen the protection of the largest flows of refugees in modern history while facing donor fatigue and asylum country fatigue, she's also pushed the frontiers of thinking about humanitarian emergencies. After 40 years where the politics of the Cold War heavily constrained her predecessors, in a new context that's sometimes even more confusing, Mrs. Ogata has worked to shift the focus of UNHCR so that alongside its mission to protect refugees is a growing mandate to work towards solutions to refugee problems. This has meant looking carefully at refugee producing countries and in some cases has actually meant taking action in regions where conflicts are ongoing. For example, UNHCR was one of the first agencies on the ground in Bosnia and maintained a presence there even during the worst fighting. Not infrequently during her tenure, Dr. Ogata has taken unpopular stands in order to spur deliberately needed action on the part of other actors in the international community, sometime including governments like our own. Unwilling to stand by while the Serbian nationalists and the Bosnian government obstructed deliveries of food and blankets, Mrs. Ogata simply announced that she would suspend all relief to Bosnia unless the international community took immediate action to ensure the flow of aid. Well, for those of you who've been watching the news this past weekend, She's been in the midst of some of the most difficult choices about the Great Lake area of Africa with Zaire and Rwanda and Burundi and movements of people which at one stage this weekend was a, a mass of people uh, 15 miles uh, long, which if you try to ask yourself how far is that from Harvard Square, in an era where multilateral organizations are increasingly under fire, Mrs. Ogata has proved herself a manager as well as a leader. Under her guidance, UNHCR completed a comprehensive review of their management structure 
and has implemented major changes and is now undertaking a major strategic review. And indeed, when Abe Shays, uh, a professor from the law school, asked Mrs. Ogata tonight uh, over cocktails, well, but you and HCR ain't broken. Why are you fixing it? Her response uh, equally quickly was, uh, oftentimes it's best to fix things before they're broken. Okay? <laughs> A very un-American perspective, but nonetheless, I think, uh, has served her very well. Perhaps most remarkable of all, at least to me as a close watcher of Mrs. Ogata over many years, she and her agency have not only done a, done a good job, indeed performed very effectively in coping with some of the most difficult, desperate conditions in the world, but she's also at the same time managed to win the support of many people in the U.S. Congress, including many Republicans, while doing a good job. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. S Ogata to speak to us on world order, internal conflict, and refugees. Thank you very much, Professor Graham Allison. Um, it is really a great honor to come here. It's actually the second honor, I would say. I was really very touched when I received an honorary degree from Harvard in 93. And now you're giving me the second honor of addressing this forum. Thank you very much. Um, I, wa I am an academic by training and by in my heart. But today I wanted to throw out some of my thoughts, partially based on my academic instinct and I'm a political scientist, and I hope you'll forgive me for being that among those who have uh, been majoring in other disciplines. But also, uh, I wanted to, out of my own experience, ask you questions. And this is why I've chosen the title of the World, <coughs> world Order, Refugees, and uh, what was the third item? Internal huh? conflict. Internal, right. World order, internal conflict, and refugees. That's the order, right, sorry. <laughs> um, I would like to start, I became the High Commissioner for Refugees in the spring of 91. And I'd like to go back to that time. This was a time when we used the phrase new world order. It was very fashionable. And there was a lot of sort of euphoria. Maybe a better world is coming. But you will recognize that this phrase is no longer fashionable because we are all overwhelmed by the ceaseless disorder around the world and the immense human suffering it entails. And you see this now very much uh, dramatized in the Great Lakes region of Africa. Even those who foresaw order in news order uh, in 91 were assuming the relevance of a concept of an international peace and security based on what you would call the Westphalian state system. I'm not going to question the Westphalian state system because there are many of you here in Cambridge from varying positions of realism and idealism are struggling with this concept and this issue. But I must raise questions to whether this system is providing us the necessary tools to address the ongoing violent conflict, in particular within states today, and the consequent human suffering. Just as the New World Order was being trumpeted, changes that began in 1989 and the internal conflict in Iraq after the Gulf War made very clear that international relations theorists and observers had focused insufficiently on conflicts which took place within states. When attention was paid to them, these conflicts were subsumed under the broad ideological confrontation of the Cold War, which had imposed some form of internal discipline. For those of us working with refugees, of course, the phenomenon of internal conflict related to ethnic and communal divisions, human rights violations, discriminatory policies, and bad governance was nothing new. Currently, my office is responsible for some 26.1 million people, uh, of which 13.3 million are refugees, 4.8 million others of some concern, 
and this is a bit of a technical term, but they're refugee-like people, and 8.1 million returnees and internally displaced persons inside their own countries. In other words, we are doing a lot of work for those who are in their own countries, but displa displaced for various reasons. Examples of our involvement with refugees from long-standing internal conflict are, among others, Rwanda and Burundi. And I must say, just I said a few minutes ago, for Rwanda refugees, we opened the first office in Bujumbura, Burundi in 1959. So it's a long-standing internal conflict that is taking place. Uganda, Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Burma, and Iraq. All of these countries produced refugees, refugee flows, ranging from a few to several thousands. These examples, for the most part, did not attract much interna international attention at that time. Other significant refugee flows were produced by what I would call proxy wars, internal conflicts fueled by Cold War superpower rivalry, such as we have seen in Angola, Mozambique, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Nicaragua, and other countries in Central America and in the Horn of Africa. The victims of these proxy wars must, of course, be forgiven for never grasping the presumed stability of bipolarity during the Cold War. From the perspective of UNHCR, we do see, perhaps, greater continuity in the phenomenon of internal conflict than is often argued in the literature. Yet, how we respond to internal conflict now is quite different from the way we did before. Until fairly recently, and with only few exceptions, UNHCR essentially waited on the other side of an international border to receive and to protect refugees fleeing conflict. This approach was determined by the very concept of international protection of refugees, which would come into play if, and only if, victims of persecution or violent conflict fled their homeland. It was also dictated by the concept of state sovereignty and the consequent reluctance of the intergovernmental organizations, such as UNHCR, to be seen as being too involved in the internal conditions of countries that produce refugees that might give rise to refugee movements and might be held responsible. It can be said that the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, and from my perspective, I just assume that everybody knows about this convention, but a convention was a widely accepted convention was set up, was drawn in 1951 that determines that, that how refugees must be protected by all the uh, refugee, uh, by all the international, uh, various governments. And this is quite a refugee protection regime that exists today. Now, this uh, re convention relating to the status of refugee was premised on the theoretical predictability of the Westphalian state system and was heavily influenced by the reality of the Cold War bipolar, Cold War bipolar system that existed. Instead of remain reactive, and that is, if you wait on the other side of the border, you react to a situation and wait till people come. We have now begun to adopt a more active approach. In recent years, UNHCR has become increasingly involved inside conflict-torn states, providing assistance and protection to the extent possible to internally displaced persons, as we have been doing in Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Mozambique, Bosnia, or in Tajikistan. There is a direct linkage between internal displacement and refugee flows, as the causes of displacement may be indistinguishable. And the only distinction being the fact that the former have not crossed international border. It raises, however, difficult questions, as it touches upon national sovereignty. Consent of the state concerned is an essential condition for UNHCR to exercise its protection function toward internally displaced people. In many instances, however, there is no functioning government to grant consent 
as the country may be de facto governed by competing military and political factions. This is the kind of world we are living today. Another consequence of the predominance of internal conflicts over inter-state wars has been an increasing reluctance of states to grant asylum to refugees. Let me hasten to add that it has never been easy to persuade governments to grant asylum, but it has become more difficult, primarily for three reasons. First, to the degree that previous refugee flows were often linked to the proxy wars of the Cold War, many states sometimes had a strategic interest in hosting refugee populations. Other refugee movements were linked to colonial liberation wars. Motives for granting asylum ranged from genuine sympathy for refugees to the military uses of refugee populations. Second, governments of Africa established a truly remarkable record in granting asylum to refugees and in adhering to the principle that the granting of asylum should not be seen as a hostile act. While one can still find many examples of this generosity in Africa, the sheer magnitude and accompanying spread of insecurity has created severe strains. In addition, the increasing reluctance of donor governments to pay the bills for maintaining large numbers of refugees has had a negative impact upon the willingness of countries to provide asylum. Third, as countries in the North are facing large and what they consider to be irregular migratory flows into their countries, the critical distinction between refugees and migrants has become blurred and eroding the consensus on the importance of asylum. As a consequence of these three reasons, options have been examined to provide international protection inside countries of origin. As in the case of northern Iraq, Rwanda, and to a lesser extent Bosnia, so-called temporary safe areas or zones have been created by the international community, sometimes without the consent of the state concerned, to provide protection and assistance to displaced people inside their own country. Shifts with respect to the search for solutions to refugee problems, that is, local integration, resettlement, and voluntary repatriation, have also taken place in recent years. In the Cold War era, emphasis was placed upon resettlement and local integration. Until a few years ago, it was assumed that repatriation could take place only after a significant change in the political order of the refugee-creating country or following a peace settlement. Today, voluntary repatriation is considered the most desirable solution to humanitarian crises and active steps are being taken to create favorable security, political, human rights, and socioeconomic conditions to enable refugees and displaced persons to return home. Voluntary repatriation is taking place to relatively safe and secure areas in countries engulfed in internal conflict or in the absence of a peace agreement. Repatriation to Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Cambodia belong to the first category, that is, going back to relatively, uh, going back to places where there was already a significant change, political change or a peace agreement. While repatriation efforts to Afghanistan, Somalia, Haiti, and Rwanda belong to the category in which uh, people are going back to relatively safe areas or going back into a situation which were still a bit fragile. For example, UNHCR has assisted in the voluntary repatriation of some 3.9 million Afghans since return movements began in 1989, and some 900,000 Somalis since 1992. Peacekeeping operations have also contributed toward creating the conditions for voluntary return, and as part of peace settlements, international supervisory mechanisms have been set up to monitor the human rights situations, including that of returnees inside countries, as in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Rwanda, and Haiti. And finally, the concept of state responsibility has receded in some context. First, there is a responsibility of states to avoid policies that lead to refugee flows. 
Second, there's a responsibility on the part of governments receiving refugees to allow them to enter, not to return them forcibly back to a situation where their lives would be endangered, and to ensure basic law and order and security in refugee camps and settlements. Third, there is a state responsibility of governments with respect to receiving refugees who are their own nationals returning home. In reality, however, states often avoid the responsibilities or they simply do not possess the capacity to meet them, as in the case of so-called failed states or countries just emerging from conflicts. The growing number of weak and failed conflict-ridden states may be symptomatic of the state system today. Even though international relations theorists, analysts, and politicians have paid increasing attention to the phenomenon of internal conflict over the last several years, much uncertainty remains regarding both diagnosis and prescri prescription. Diagnosis of internal conflict remains difficult, as this phrase covers a complex changing web of causes. Also, in general, we know who our counterparts are at the level of the at the level of the state are. But this is not always the case regarding other categories of political actors, such as ethnic and religious groups or warlords. What is clear is the intolerable level of human suffering and forced displacement engend engendered by these conflicts. It may be better even for scholars, policymakers, and practitioners when studying or analyzing the present world order and state system to start with a full recognition of the intolerable symptoms to, to, to reach some sound prescriptions for desirable solutions. At least I can say for certain that as we pursue the search for a new world order, it is important to start examining the linkages between internal conflict and interstate power relationships. While it is true that the sheer number and intensity of internal conflicts call into question traditional thinking on international peace and security, it is also true that we consider to be internal conflict is somewhat unclear. This is particularly true in the situation of collapsing multi-ethnic empires and multi-ethnic states. Over the last few years, we have witnessed in the CIS and neighboring countries, this is the former USSR countries, patterns of conflict and displacement, reminiscence of the collapse of the multi-ethnic Habsburg and Ottoman empires. Such a collapse requires quick rethinking as to what is internal and what is international. Sometimes the rethinking can be a little too quick, as demonstrated in the early recognition of the constituted republics of former Yugoslavia as independent states and the ethnic and territorial conflicts that followed. What constitutes an international border has also become unclear in many instances. Cessationist movements, demands for self-determination or state implosion have given rise to so-called soft borders. In some instances, internally displaced persons have become refugees or vice versa, nearly overnight. In the case of Chechnya, for example, UNHCR has been assisting internally displaced persons, not refugees in the traditional sense, fleeing the fighting in the neighboring republics of Dagestan and Ingushetia, but has restrained from operating inside Chechnya. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, the inter-entity boundary lines are de facto ethnic borders, obstructing refugees and displaced persons to return to their homes in minority-controlled areas. Out of nearly three million refugees and displaced persons, only some in Bosnia and from Bosnia and Herzegovina, only some 250,000 have returned since the peace settlement was signed, and nearly their return has been exclusively to majority-controlled areas. When I say, when I talked like this, you may wonder why the High Commissioner for Refugees who is the supposed champion of humanitarian action, hammers on the linkages between internal conflict and interstate power configuration. I wanted to pose this question tonight because from my own experience, 
while causes for internal conflict may be largely endogenous. Their solutions are greatly influenced by the impact that particular interstate relations bear on the development of conflicts. Returning to the situation in northern Iraq in 1995, 1991, which, and which I uh, started my address tonight, it was the converging interests of the coalition forces consisting of the major Western powers, United States, United Kingdom, France, etc., to protect the strategic oil produce producing region of the Gulf that forced them to military action. They recognized Turkey's security concerns not to allow the inflow of Kurdish refugees. Consequently, refugees were stopped at the mountainous borders and a safe area was established in northern Iraq, not in the country of supposed asylum, but in the country of origin, to allow people to return. UNHCR was given the task to protect, assist, and reintegrate the Kurds in northern Iraq in a less than fully secure environment, with only 500 UN guards to monitor their fate. Turning to the situation in Bosnia, it was the lack of converging major power interests that prolonged the conflict and obliged the United Nations peacekeeping forces to concentrate on the protection and the continuation of humanitarian assistance led by UNHCR. It was really a moral dilemma for UNHCR and other humanitarian agencies to carry on humanitarian assistance while feeling increasingly helpless in containing ethnic cleansing, that is, mass displacement of ethnic groups, which was the very objective of the brutal conflict. It may not be an exaggeration to say that the, when the war in Bosnia escalated to the point of undermining the Atlantic partnership, the major powers forced the contact group, that is, the group consisting of negotiators from the United States, France, United Kingdom, Russia, and Germany, to negotiate a settlement that finally led to the Dayton Agreement. It is not a surprise, therefore, that the implementation of the Dayton Agreement has been entrusted to the NATO forces, the very alliance which was threatened by the Balkan War. What is maintaining the fra fra fragile transition from war to peace is the security assurance provided by the NATO for powers. Return of refugees and the displays is a central component of this peace transition. The greatest refugee crisis that currently cha challenges my office is in the Great Lakes region of Africa. And I think in the last week you're all watching this and maybe wondering why on earth is the High Commissioner here and not there? The eth I have good colleagues who are covering, but I shall leave the country, the United States, pretty soon. The ethnic conflict in Rwanda resulting in the 1994 genocide led to the outflow of 1.7 million Hutu refugees in Zaire, Tanzania, and Burundi. The ethnic conflict in Burundi, too, has produced 250,000 internally displaced persons and refugees who have fled to Tanzania and Zaire. In spite of considerable stability and reconstruction in Rwanda itself, relatively few refugees have returned home. They have opted to remain in refugee camps, receiving minimal assistance rather than risking return to their original homes. Appeals for negotiations, justice, and reconciliation have not yet borne fruit. The security in the border areas between Zaire, Rwanda, and Burundi have deteriorated significantly in recent weeks to a warlike situation, involving military action of countries in the region. The international community has so far taken few steps of significant impact. The complex relationship between the Western powers and the individual countries in the region has not produced a convergence of interest among them to take action. I addressed the Security Council this past Friday, where I stated that it is clear more than ever that the situation in Eastern Zaire has reached a critical point to which a solely humanitarian response is inadequate. How long the conflict situation in the Great Lakes region will be allowed to fester or to explode will depend largely on the vehemence with which parties of the inter internal conflicts will pursue their objectives. 
the partisan involvement of the countries in the region, and the level of tolerance that the major powers will allow before the situation reaches an explosive point. When internal conflicts deteriorate to the point of war, the path to peace will require stringent political action or even military intervention. But here I wish to argue that further measures are required to nurture peace once it is reached or to prevent conflict from, from recurring. Here again, the role of refugees in the painful and difficult transition from war to peace is crucial. As I discussed a few months ago at the seminar sponsored jointly by UNHCR and the International Peace Academy held at Princeton University, the process of repatriation of refugees is a crucial part of conflict resolution and may add significantly to the peace building process. There are three critical aspects of repatriation in the transition from war to peace, reconstruction, demilitarization, and reconciliation. Reconstruction of the basic social and economic infrastructure is an obvious condition for repatriation and recovering from war. Demilitarization is necessary to resolve the security di dilemma which gives rise to internal conflict and to prevent the former combatants from taking up arms again. However, while reconstruction and demilitarization are critical to sustainable repatriation of refugees, it is the issue of reconciliation that present, presents the greatest challenge. War-torn societies are fragile, and unless the wounds of war can be healed, and people can agree to resolve their differences in a peaceful manner, further incidents and violence are likely to occur. At the same time, the way in which repatriation and reintegration of refugee populations are handled will influence the chances for reconciliation and thus will play an important part in the peace building effort. At the very least, the web of rights and obligations between the state and its citizens must be restored. Crucial in this respect are the efforts to establish the rule of law. Also, there's a growing recognition that peace can be sustained only if it is combined with some measure of justice, particularly among populations which have been the victims of genocide other crimes against humanity, and serious human rights violations. There must be minimum consensus on the balance between the competing demands of peace and justice, of forgiveness and ending impunity. Reconciliation is a long and difficult road. It takes time, and there are no quick fixes. In the light of these considerations, let me turn to the concept of world order, where I wanted to, to concentrate tonight's address. Engaged as I am with the plight of people who are victims of persecution, repression, and violence, it is hard, sometimes hard for me to see the order in the present international system. While the traditional norms of state sovereignty and international security have evolved over the past few years, we still remain far away from a new paradigm which will permit us to address the plight of refugees and even more so of the millions of people displaced inside their own countries, whose number today in fact surpasses that of refugees. It is as accepted that multilateral action has a role to play in preventing armed conflicts and negotiating peace agreements in internal conflicts. It is less clear to see how these actors, states, political and opinion leaders, scholars, NGOs, and international organizations can be mobilized on a long-term path to building peace. Can the larger number of activities required for dealing with conflicts and the transition from war to peace, such as peacekeeping, electoral assistance, human rights promotion, demobilization, refugee repatriation, humanitarian assistance and development aid be sequenced, coordinated, and most importantly, sustain to reach the point of preventing the recurrence of violence. The tool of indirect intervention through humanitarian action has become increasingly crucial, but is not enough. I understand in that in this country, the current question is, are you better off than you were four years ago? As it pertains to refugees, I would, in guarded terms, give a qualified yes. 
It has been some two years now since there has been a massive refugee emergency, such as those that we witnessed between 1991 and 1994. Though new emergencies cannot be excluded, as currently I fear in Eastern Zaire, the repatriation of 1.7 million refugees, 1.7 million refugees to Mozambique, and of some 100,000 refugees to Mali and Togo, and a fragile peace in Bosnia are no meager accomplishments. Will we be better off four years from now? It is true that compared with the past, in the last few years, many valuable attempts have been made to save lives during conflict and to broker and build peace. But too many people remain displaced. Too many conflicts continue unresolved. Too many questions surround the sustainability of multilateral action for peace building efforts. Too many voices are now heard saying the conflicts and displacements far away are not of our concern. Nevertheless, I believe that the recent focus on internal conflicts and consequent displacement of millions of refugees and displaced persons is a very important first step in the right direction. It leads to a more fundamental and full understanding of the issue of international peace and security in the years to come. If solutions to internal conflicts are to be reinforced by international efforts, the new world order will have to be conceived on the basis of peace and security of people. Maintaining peace and security among states must encompass the prevention and solution of internal conflicts which bring human tragedies and ma massive displacement of people. Thank you very much. Dr. Ogata is uh, prepared to take uh, questions for purposes of discussion. Uh, there are microphones here on the ground floor, on the left and the right, and I think in the balcony as well. Let me ask you to line up. Uh, let's, uh, Harvard students, uh, please, uh, maybe the first questions, but in, whoever wants to ask a question, you should identify yourself uh, because this is being uh, um, taped for, for uh, subsequent broadcast on public radio, and put your question succinctly, please. Yes, my name is Fukawa. I'm studying at this Kennedy School. Uh, my question is, uh, how does your organization uh, operate, operate under the influence of the uh, major donor countries such as US or Japan? Uh, does your organization necessarily have to reflect the foreign policy priorities of these countries? And uh, if so, have you ever felt some kind of frustration from this perspective? You, do you want me to answer right away? Well, you see, fortunately, there are a couple of major donors, and you don't have to rely on just one. But I'd like to give uh, full recognition to the fact that the United States has been and continues to be the largest donor to my office. There's no areas or anything. It's voluntary contribution, which means recognition of, to our work. Uh, yes, it is sometimes difficult when a major donor's national interest is at stake. But I think the good thing about refugee protection is that even with the most powerful nations, sometimes they need us. Like the United States needed us very much in dealing with the Haitian refugees, and we helped try to figure out a way in, in setting up uh, screening uh, centers in order to see each major donor wants to act properly. And there we come in. And this is why they would like to, they need our cooperation to work out a system that would perhaps uh, respond to their national interests, but also to the international commitment. So it is uh, sometimes, of course, I have difficulties but I don't think we will be blamed to be under one uh, dominant interest of a country because refugee protection is a very, very well established regime and there are principles that have to be observed. Gentlemen, 
Um, yes, my name is Randy Triesenberg. I'm a first-year student at the Kennedy School. You've spoken this evening about uh, the difficulties in um, determining what is an internal conflict, um, even of the fact that sometimes there is no government in or, um, to ask for UN assistance. In these situations, um, how do we reconcile our d desire to um, aid a country uh, humani um, with humanitarian aid and uh, reconcile that with the UN Charter that says the UN does not interfere in the internal affairs of a nation. What is an internal affair has evolved a lot these days. And so even in the U overall UN context, uh, there are different schools of thought. There are different governments that uh, say, everything is fine so long as you don't come into my country. There, that does exist. But uh, I think uh, uh, my office was follows the UN Charter, but there is a statute that has uh, uh, set up my office and also the Convention on the Status of Refugees, which means that uh, refugees will have to be protected, first of all, if they're moving out of, out of their country. But at the same time, there's so many situations today in which the same people would have crossed the border had they had the chance. I would like to give you the example of Somalia. Somalia, there, was, uh, there is still hardly a government that controls the whole country. But when the Somali refugees were leaving towards Kenya, we waited on the Kenyan border. But that meant that a lot of people had to walk days in order to get protection. And so we, fortunately, since there was the sovereignty was rather on the loose side then, we, we, decided, <laughs> we decided to undertake a cross-border operation. That is, we would go into Somalia and help those who were leaving for the same reason uh, of for those who were crossing. There were many people who were moving towards the border and we were able to help them. And that way, there were two advantages. We saved a lot of suffering, but on the same time when the fighting went, uh, ceased, many people went back more quickly. So the solutions were better in hand. And I don't think there's anybody who questions the wisdom of this kind of approach. Up here on the left uh, balcony. Uh, good evening. My name is Sharon Sinar, and I'm an undergraduate at Harvard. Um, I'm also a member of the Harvard International Relations Council. Uh, we are pleased to co-sponsor this event tonight. Uh, my question is sort of a follow-up on the issue of internal conflict. And as you mentioned, internal displacement has in recent years come increasingly within the mandate of the UNHCR. And my question is, under what specific circumstances or conditions does UNHCR deal with internally displaced people? And in what conditions are those people addressed through other UN, UN agencies, but not officially within the UNHCR mandate? Um, in for internal, com internal uh, displaced per persons, we, off we go and uh, assist them Protection is, uh, I would say, maybe international protection as such may be a little bit too much to say. But we certainly try to protect them against all sorts of hazards and some unlawful, uh, pers uh, what shall I say, uh, harassment by the authorities. But very often, upon the request of the Secretary General or by the General Assembly, good o it's on a good offices basis. And our own executive committee, which supervises or advises my programs, have said, have agreed that for situations in which the, these people would have fled similar to the refugees, that we would be moving in and should be helping these internally displaced persons. There is no international agency that has a mandate for internal displaced persons. That would be an anomaly. But I think my office has uh, the clear mandate for the largest to do uh, to help the internally displaced persons, and we probably deal with the largest number. Here in the right balcony. Good evening. My name is Victoria Kennedy. I'm a senior um, at Harvard Radcliffe Colleges. I have a specific question um, about the problem in Bosnia. Um, refugees in, in Bosnia are finding the problem of when they come back to their homes, um, they're finding them burned to the ground along with um, other property. So my question is, uh, what is the UN doing to either prevent um, this from occurring, or is the UN compensating refugees that are coming back to find their properties burned? The property issue is the largest issue 
or one of the largest issue facing return to Bosnia. And uh, there is the absolute shortage of, prop of housing to begin with. 60% of the houses have been destroyed. And if you ask me what I'm doing, I have spent $70 million this year repairing houses so that people can go back. And this is a major program. I have further identified 22 areas in which if money could be spent, a lot more houses could be restored or, re or uh, repaired or rebuilt, and that more, many more people will come. So there's that issue. But the question of whose property are we repairing is a very delicate one. And the Dayton Agreement in Annex 7 does set up a property commission. However, the commission has really not been really able to function for lack of funds and so on. But, but the real problem we're facing is that a lot of the property that exists today are occupied by people who were not the original owners. And so in returning people, we have to find ways of uh, getting some kind of a housing for those who are displaced and occupying other people's property. And so it's a very, very complicated process. Um, and it will take time. But, you, but the uh, Dayton has set up this property commission. We are doing the shelter projects. There are bilateral donations to do some. Uh, USAID is have some shelter projects. It will take time, but this is happening. And this shell property issue will solve a lot of the return problems. Gentleman on the right. Good evening, my name is James Conda. I'm from uh, Harvard Business School. Um, the organizational effectiveness of um, the UN is of uh, great concern to all of us. Uh, from your specific experiences in uh, reforming your organization, what specific uh, lessons do you have for the UN as a whole? I was in New York and discussing this just last week. Everybody has a different idea about what the reform should be. But I think the general consensus is that the UN has to be much more e efficient and effective. But there is the part of the UN that is the Secretariat, which is under the mandate of the Secretary General to manage that. And then there's what uh, I would call semi-independent agencies like ours, which is uh, funded differently and are, we are uh, advised or supervised by intergovernmental bodies and we have separate, uh, dis uh, distinct mandates. And very much our reform would be on uh, trying to work it out among ourselves in uh, terms of better efficiency and effectiveness. And then there's the whole UN system, which includes all the specialized agencies. Right now, each one is trying to be as efficient and as effective as possible. Now, whether how this will all link up, I don't know. But the trend is very much there, trying to be more efficient. Thank you. Uh, my name is Debrati Ghosh. I'm a sophomore at the college, also a member of the International Relations Council at Harvard. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned the concept of state responsibility in your uh, remarks. And I was wondering if you felt, uh, if you, in your new world, or in your vision of a new world order, you saw a role for a system of state liability in conjunction with uh, the idea of responsibility, where a state is held well, a state is held accountable for any uh, delinquents in, with respect to its responsibility towards uh, internally displaced peoples. What would you get by holding states? Uh, beyond responsibility, you are arguing whether liability. What kind of liability would you think would, uh, would be compensation and this kind of thing? Well, How do you go about that? I, I'm just not quite sure what you are asking. Okay. Uh, for instance, if a nation, oops, sorry, um, if a nation were uh, not, if if what, people of a certain nationality weren't being adequately protected, I understand that people of a certain nationality would not be adequately protected within one nation if they were fleeing that nation. However, um, is there some sort of uh, we mentioned, for instance, very specifically um, the responsibility um, of a nation not to return uh, refugees to a nation which could not pr uh, adequately protect them. So now, is, would you envision some sort of international 
uh, system of liability where the international community held a particular nation responsible for not adequately protecting refugees or internally displaced people? Well, the international community has set up systems. I think the most uh, recent example is the international tribunal for, for uh, crim criminal tribunals. That is one thing. And whether you, that is more re uh, uh, directed to, not to states, but certain political leaders or certain individuals within state. The international community has set up a lot of human rights conventions with implementation clauses. That is another way of going about it. So one by one in different phases, there is some system moving on for uh, holding states responsible and trying to uh, figure out uh, beyond responsibility to, to have concrete means of uh, seeking, uh, of addressing their liability. But uh, I think the most, uh, in most cases, I mean, something like uh, war reparation, those things exist, but they're pretty specific. And to uh, hold, spe uh, re I, I would say that the most advanced uh, or indirect way today that exists is much more in the human rights areas. But it's very hard to, to uh, punish states as a whole for the kind of human rights violations. It has to be sp on specific uh, aspects of the uh, particular violations, I would say. You're in the left-hand balcony. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Yuveta Doge, and I'm a graduate student at the Harvard um, Graduate School of Education. My question deals with education and the refugee camps. Um, first, does the UN have any mandates regarding educating children in these camps? If so, how are they implemented? If you don't have any mandates, do you have any interest in educating children in refugee camps? And if so, how is that interest expressed? Thank you. Uh, I have a mandate to protect refugees. And within that protection, assistance is part of the protection. And also, I would say, uh, protecting it means looking into the welfare of the people. Yes, we do have education uh, programs. Uh, I think uh, at the primary school level, my budget for education is about $50 million. That covers primary education. Beyond that, it becomes much less. And we do try to do uh, various uh, uh, secondary education. Uh, there is a small fund for advanced education. I think these are programs that we would really like to uh, promote. Because if you spend 20 years in an a refugee camp, whether it was in Afghanistan, Afghan refugees or the Cambodian refugees. If you are not educated at all for 20 years, you lose a generation, and nobody wants that. Sometimes when the money doesn't come, we just have to concentrate on life-saving assistance, food, medicine, so on, and the education we have to skip. But I would really like to maintain at least good primary education keeps the children out of mischief, too. <laughs> You're in the right-hand balcony. Thank you. My name is John Heidenrich. I am a graduate of the Kennedy School. Uh, Madam High Commissioner, uh, a few years ago there was talk of perhaps establishing or at least considering the idea of uh, an international rapid deployment force or something of that sort, not on the scale of Desert Storm, but more equivalent to the UN guards in northern Iraq. Since the consensus for this or something similar is, is presently lacking, to put it mildly, at, at present. I was wondering if uh, you or, or someone in your office uh, has, has considered some alternatives, and, and could you speak to that issue, please? Uh, I, I, uh, there, is a, uh, no, there are several governments, and I think Canadians and some of the Nordics uh, developed a rapid deployment uh, force concept of some 10,000 persons or something like that, which would be always available for preventing emergencies, I think it would be awfully useful. If I had a couple of battalions, I would be very happy. <laughs> Thank you. Now, if, if any battalions are being volunteered, I think we have a taker here on the right. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Michael Yandel. I'm a second year here at the Kennedy School. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my question concerns um, the issue of repatriation that you have alluded to several times this night. 
and um, the specific considerations that you have to take when uh, promoting and assisting repatriation and uh, what would those be and specifically how do these considerations when you decide to advocate and promote repatriation balance against possible rights of refugees uh, in other countries who have there been for a prolonged period of time um, to stay in those countries. In other words, when does uh, a temporary protected status turn into a, a prolonged uh, permanent status? Thank you. You really ask the most difficult question because this, the question of how do you promote repatriation is a difficult. Uh, incidentally, my uh, mandate is not only protection, but solving refugee problems. That is in my mandate, and this is a very difficult one. As I said, you solve refugee. There are three ways of solving, ge generally speaking. That is to integrate them into the country of asylum. That requires the agreement of the country of asylum. To resettle them in a third country, like to the United States. And that, too, requires not only the desire on the part of the refugees to be resettled, but on the agreement of the country that would agree to the resettlement. So in today's world, when the number is so large, repatriation is the major solution. And I think this is why repatriation is receiving more and more attention. However, we feel that the, rep the refugees you say the, the right of the refugees to stay, but there's no obligation of the re refugee receiving countries to keep them either. So between this uh, two right and obligation, we have to create conditions that would make the refugees feel that they can go back. And so this is why we have to work much, much more in the country of asylum, I mean the country of origin. So just recently, before the East Zairean crisis, took a, a much more violent form. We had just reached some kind of a policy agreement between Rwanda, my office, uh, Burundi, Tanzania, and the various um, donor governments of how to promote return to Rwanda. Rwanda, in principle, accepts the return and even says, please come back. But the situation inside Rwanda is such that perceived from the refugee point of view is not sure enough not attractive enough. So there is that hesitation. So we have to help the judicial system and all that within Rwanda or monitoring by uh, human rights monitors and so on in order to create that condition. And then try to persuade the co governments that have, you know, keeping a million people by Zaire or six or 700,000 people by Tanzania. It's no easy task. They are poor countries. Their own resources are really uh, exhausted, environments damaged, and yet they have been keeping these people. And so you have to help these countries and the communities affected to feel that what they are doing is something they do it for their neighbors. So it's a very, very complicated persuasion, condition-making, um, assistance-obtaining process, and yet, I think it's better that refugees, once the condition in their own countries has turned more satisfactory, to go back. Thank you. Monsef Khan, Mason Fellow and uh, former uh, UN staff. Madam Commissioner, uh, if one look at all or most of the conflicts UNHCR deals with, uh, at the root of those conflicts you have socio-economic uh, problems and the lack of economic development or imbalanced development. Now, I, I fully share with you your uh, skepticism with respect to the uh, so-called world order. And let me recall that in 76, the uh, G77 has called for the establishment of a new international economic order. That call, unfortunately, has not been heard. And today, the gap between the North and the South is wider than ever. Uh, in that respect, it seems to me a uh, paradox that uh, major donors are eager or ready to fund uh, activities such as uh, those of UNHCR, which I'm really glad for you, 
but those very donors seem to be reluctant or not as eager to fund uh, social economic programs of the common system. Now, since you're a, uh, an academic as well, allow me to ask you an academic question and uh, as to how you would address this paradox were you to become the next Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> Thank you. You asked me that to asking as a, a, an academic. So. <laughs> no, uh, yes, economic, social problems do fester discontent. But refugee crises are not just out of poverty. It is injustice, deprivation of rights, when economic poverty turns into social disequilibrium. disequilibrium. And added to that is the political tension. And then fighting, conflict. Then that is the most direct uh, influence uh, causes that lead to, uh, to uh, refugee outflow. And so what I am doing is really band-aid things. No, it has to be changed. It has to be done from the bottom. But I don't, but I, that having said, I don't say that if you eradicate poverty, that countries would be all. It's much more complicated, political dynamics, military dynamics, and then the, the development. So I think what I am telling my development colleagues is not just to think that the world is flat. Every country, if you just development, economically social would be peace. No, there are the other conditions that add to the political instability and so on, and you have to develop from where, uh, from a, a, a greater realization of what causes this equilibrium. And I think that is uh, maybe a more important uh, examination as you look into the, the development strategy. Now, uh, I hope you didn't give the, get the impression that I was pessimistic about a new world order. I think the next order, what I was trying to say, is that there is no order coming out, clearly. At the same time, if you're going to talk about international order, you have to look into the internal conflict situation and link the internal situation developing in many countries that are causing these conflicts with the international order that we want to look into. And I think there, I thought the refugee issue could be a linkage. If I may just follow up, uh, how would you address the, uh, what I call the paradox of uh, the donor community with respect to the non-funding or the lack of eagerness to fund uh, socioeconomic uh, programs? I think the donor community today is doing a, a variety of things, not necessarily funding through the United Nations, but there are a lot of bilateral programs. And I think the North-South has become much more complex. There is a lot of countries that have graduated from the South, and I think there's a much more realistic cooperation that seemed to be, I won't say developing, but starting. Thank you. Okay, here on the right. Good evening, Mrs. Ogata. I am Kenji Sibia. I am a PhD student at Harvard, majoring in international health policy and economics. Uh, last week, uh, CNN and uh, the international media reported sudden inflow of Rwanda refugees again. And uh, actually, I was there two years ago as a medical officer. And uh, unfortunately, this issue has been uh, almost totally ignor ignored by the media in spite of your continuous effort. And uh, usually, we can see that. When CNN reports, everybody pays attention. Otherwise, nobody pay attention. This phenomenon, which I would like to call CNN phenomenon, can be seen everywhere. And my question is, how the UNHCR will sustain the long-term international interest in the era of aid fatigue among, among donor countries? Yeah, the CNN phenomena, so-called, has troubled a lot of us. At the same time, I would like to bring them on, my, uh, on our, our side. You know? If it were not for CNN, a lot of the humanitarian emergencies that occurred, whether it was in Iraq uh, or, uh, or uh, Bosnia, or nobody would have known anything about it. So they are important. But the problem is between the CNN A and CNN B program. There's a gap. How do you fill that? And this, I think, you have to rely much, much more on written media, uh, good stories. And this is our job to try to sustain it. 
But I would not criticize the, uh, uh, the, this uh, media interest in, in uh, crises because we need it. And it's after that, how do you continue is what is much more important. Thanks. On the left. Hello, uh, good evening. My name is Reshma, and I'm a graduate student at the School of Education here at Harvard. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is, uh, what services that does UNHCR provide um, the refugees in coping with the social emotional trauma of displacement and um, their need for safety at that point, and how well are your employees um, prepared to help the people at that level? And the second part in relation to the question earlier on education, um, you said that about 50 million of your budget was um, catering to primary education. Uh, what, I'd like to know what, um, how effective you think the education programs are in dealing with the special needs of children who are refugees, in terms of language and um, uh, identity conflict and literacy, different literacy levels. Well, to answer from the second question, I think most of the education are done trying to bring their own language education. I was, this year I visited uh, Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so most of them are Liberian refugees. The children were learning English. And this is the way it is usually, so that we prepare them for the return. Now, how effective? I don't know. I mean, it's just the same question I can ask for American schools or Japanese schools. No? So we try, but you see, they are much less advantaged. They, they are uh, disrupted in their own career. So maybe some of the refugee children get much more than they would have had if they were at home, because it depends on where they come from. We try to do it well, but I cannot say that uh, uh, it's comparable to uh, Cambridge community or something like that. I think that's a plus. Now, on the question of trauma, yes, we are beginning to put much more attention on trauma issues. We have uh, social workers more working, uh, trying to deal with uh, trauma, trauma uh, that because many of the children have gone through fighting, have seen awful things. But our own staff really receive, have to re receive much more social, con psychological counseling too. So it's, a, it's really quite a serious situation. Unfortunately, this will have to be the last question here on the right, please. Good evening, Dr. Agata. My name is Jeroen Korman, graduate student at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. You have made reference in your speech to the deterioration of the situation in Eastern Zaire. Could you please elaborate on what you think is the immediate action that the international community should take? And do you think that the individual countries in the, that make up the international community are willing to take that action? Thank you. What they should do and what they will do, there's quite a difference. And I have to be honest, you see, this is a very complex, long-term conflict, hatred, division. And uh, would anybody be really coming from the outside, bring in some effective reconciliation I don't know. And under the circumstances, how much can, what I had been hoping, and I have made this very clear, is to try to contain the level of violence. And I even at one point asked, through the Secretary General, to, the, to consider deployment of military observers on the border between Rwanda, Zaire, Burundi, Zaire. Because I knew that things were getting explosive. They were cross-border uh, incursions and so on. Uh, but who would come? Which countries would be ready to do that? Who would pay? All these things are realities in today's decision making at the United Nations. And so this was delayed, delayed, and it's in a way too late. Uh, what can be done now? I think what I have done is try to uh, appeal to all the fighting parties and maybe countries that they should refrain from attacking civilians and the refugees 
That's an appeal, that's all. You will say, is that enough? No, but that's what I can do. And then also, hopefully, that there will be governments with influence over the individual countries in the region to exercise maximum uh, pressure to stop them. That's about all I can think of right now. The, United, the Security Council asked the Secretary General to send a, uh, a, a special envoy to the region, and we would be certainly trying to, to uh, help set up this uh, UN special envoy so that there will be a, see, there has been very little political presence by the international community in this region. Humanitarian, yes. And this is what I was talking. The intervention today is much more indirect through humanitarian, but the political one is too complicated. And there are very few countries that would like to send military risking their lives. So humanitarian have been left alone. Now, there will be some kind, hopefully, of a political presence, and I hope it would be as strong and high level as possible to mediate. There has to be mediation among the various different parties. And I hope this will come soon, because lives will be lost the longer it takes to set these things up. It's very pessimistic, I'm sorry, but uh, it's a reality. Unless there are willingness by certain major powers to really risk a few things, politically, militarily. You can't do that. Well, I want to say uh, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation and a broad scope.